tears smeared Hudson's face as he dropped the rolling pin and tried to get up without affecting his left wrist. Even the slightest hint of a movement sent red-hot streaks of pain down into his hand and up his arm. It felt like his wrist was a raging bonfire. Managing to get into a sitting position, Hudson, without thinking, started to scoot back against the wall. That was when the sharp end of Foxy's pyro hook cut through the material of his shirt and scratched his back. He yelped and used his right hand and legs to move away from the writhing walls. Once there, he tried to brace himself with his right hand in the middle of the hallway floor, but then he realised he needed his right hand for self-defence. He leaned forward, grabbing the rolling pin, then sat still, trying to get control of his sobbing and his hiccuping breath. On either side of him, parts still reached and grabbed. No, Lewis reached out for him. Hudson was sitting on the green shag carpet, cradling his wrist. Get up, you sissy, Lewis screamed at him. Get up! Hudson hunched over, trying to make himself smaller than he already was. Between his knees, he saw the black and white floor. He dared a glance around. The walls still wanted him, and he was barely out of their range. He tried to think about what he had to do next. He looked around for the knife. It was a few feet down the hall. He didn't have the strength or the will to get it. On reflex, he turned his left wrist to look at his watch, and he screamed loud enough for the sound to echo through the building. He gasped for breath and, and groaned as he managed to get a glimpse of his watch face without turning his wrist any further. It was only 2.08am. He had to get through four more hours before Barry and Duane would arrive. How was he going to last that long? He looked at his wrist again and immediately wished he hadn't. He could see two broken bones poking against the underside of his skin. The sight made his stomach heave. He swallowed hard and took shallow breaths to keep himself from throwing up. Hudson shifted carefully. His urine-stained underwear and jeans were irritating his skin. His butt and thighs were burning and itchy. He wanted to get out of his clothes, but how would he do that without jostling his wrist? Maybe he could just stay where he was for the next four hours. Yeah, it would suck to sit on the hard floor with pea-saturated pants and a broken wrist. But wouldn't trying to move be worse? Hudson nodded to himself and wiped his eyes with his right hand. His heart rate began to slow down. Making that decision had calmed him somewhat. It had taken the pressure off. Things weren't that bad, he told himself. Yes, his wrist had, was badly broken and he'd have to go through all that pain again when he got it set. But at least it was his left hand and a little pee in his pants never kill anyone. He was going to be okay. You're nothing, a voice said. Hudson sucked in his breath and looked around. Less than nothing, the voice said. Hudson reacted without thinking. He dropped the rolling pin and started to put both hands down so he could prepare to stand. Again, his scream did a tour of the building. Fresh tears ran down his cheeks. Stop it, he shouted. He wasn't sure if he was yelling at himself about forgetting he had a broken wrist or if he was yelling at the noise, at the voice. High pitched and nasally, Lewis's voice was unmistake, unmistakable. So, the, so was the way he said nothing. He never made the th sound. His version of nothing sounded like nothing. You're nothing but smoke, the, voice, <laughs> the Lewis voice said. Hudson grabbed the rolling pin again and waved it in front of him uselessly. Then he tucked the rolling pin under his arm and bent over to cover his right ear with his right hand. Thankfully, he remembered not to use his left hand. But that meant that when the voice spoke again, saying, you're nothing at all, Hudson could hear it just fine through his uncovered left ear. Go away, Hudson begged the voice. He knew it wasn't going to go away. So he wasn't surprised when he heard the Lewis voice say again, nothing, nothing at all. He was surprised, though, when he turned toward the sound and saw the decayed rabbit animatronics shuffling down the hall toward him, staring intently at Hudson. The thing's mouth was moving. Nothing, it said. Less than nothing. Nothing but smoke. <laughs> and again, nothing. Less than nothing. Nothing but smoke. It was still Lewis's voice, but it was coming through the dreadful, broken teeth of the rotting animatronic. Hudson tried to shift in preparation for standing without moving his wrist. It didn't work. He had to move his left arm to get his right arm in position to push himself into an upright position. Uh, the pain brought it with a wave of nausea. 
Hudson bent over, but the sound of the animatronic taking another clicking step forced him to move again. Nearly hyperventilating, Hudson stood his back to the wall. Behind him, hands and arms brushed against his shoulder braces, uh, braces? Blades. He quickly stepped away from the wall, and he almost lost his balance. His legs felt weak. He was swaying like a sapling in the wind. He looked at the rolling pin lying on the ground. He couldn't bend over to get to it. Move, he told himself. You've got to move. He made himself look at the advancing animatronic, and that's when he saw the knife. The knife got him to move. The animatronic was only a couple feet from the knife. Hudson had to get to it first. Lunging forward, ignoring the pain in his wrist, Hudson was able to snatch up the knife just before the animatronic reached it. He took a step back and brandished the knife ahead of him. The animatronic kept advancing. Hudson took another step back and waved the knife through the air. The animatronic's pace didn't falter. Hudson swung the knife wildly, back and forth, uh, and back and forth. The animatronic was on him, reaching for him, clawing at him, and suddenly the knife blade sliced through Hudson's bicep. Hudson screamed, turned, and ran as scorching pain erupted in his arm. Warmth trickled down his bicep, through the crook of his elbow, and from his forearm to his injured wrist. Nothing divided in half is nothing, Lewis's voice called out behind Hudson. Hudson nearly tripped and fell. How could he have forgotten? Lewis, the real Lewis, had said that very thing to him when Lewis had slashed Hudson with a knife just before the fire. The knife was the reason the fire happened. Why had Hudson suppressed that memory? It didn't matter now. Nothing mattered except getting away from the robot corpse thing that was after him. He forced himself to move down the hall, but his steps faltered and he had to grab the wall for support. One of the animatronic mouths bit his right forearm and he screamed, once again moving away from the wall. He had to get out of this hallway. He started running, stumbling, staggering, weaving, but trying to stay in the centre of the hall. Every jarring step was pain-filled, but he kept going. Reaching the far corner of the hallway, Hudson looked over his shoulder to see how close his pursuer was. He slid to a stop. No one was behind him. The hallway was empty and its walls were still. Well, it wasn't completely empty. A bloody but uh, butcher knife lay on the floor near where Hudson was when the animatronic slashed him. Or did it? Had he imagined it? He looked down at his arm. He sure hadn't imagined that. A sickingly wide gap in his skin ran from his upper bicep to just above his elbow. Blood was still gushing co copi copiously, <laughs> copiously down his arm over his busted wrist and dripping off his fingers. He had to stop the bleeding. He started to put his right hand over the wound, but he paused. Why was his right hand bloody? He hadn't touched the wound yet. It was bloody like it had been splashed with blood when it slashed. No, he did not slash himself. Did he? Hudson shook his head several times and concentrated on how he was going to stop the bleeding in his arm. He'd used up all his first aid supplies on his head wound. Wavering on his feet, Turning to look around him every two seconds, crying and unable to stop, Hudson tried to think, what should he do? As he watched the flow of the blood, he realised it wouldn't flow as fast if the arm wasn't hanging down. So he lifted his arm, but he'd forgotten about his wrist again. The broken bones under the skin ground together as they rotated and he screeched in pain. He tried to raise his arm above the level of his heart, but the pain wouldn't let him. Panicking because he was starting to feel weak, Hudson tore the wrap off his injured head and awkwardly tried to re-situate it around his upper arm. There wasn't enough material to cover the entire wound. Material. Of course, he could use the towels from the gift shop, and then he could break the front doors of the building and get out of here. Hudson had to get to the lobby, fast. Once again, surveying the hall to be sure he was alone and not under attack by the wolves, Hudson looked as fast as he could toward the lobby. Every step jolted his wrist, and he had to fight the nausea that wanted him to sit down and stop moving. Keep going, he told himself. Keep going. Don't stop again. But nearly at the end of the hall, he did stop. He'd forgotten the rolling pin. He looked back down the hall. The rolling pin was gone. And where was his nightstick and the hammer? The last he'd seen them was in the hands reaching from the wall. Moaning, Hudson stared at the spot on the floor where he was sure he'd left the wooden utensil. He willed it to be there, but it wasn't. 
Hudson whimpered and turned his back on what he couldn't explain. He staggered forward again. Concentrating, he willed his feet to keep moving. As he passed Pirate's Cove, Hudson told himself he was halfway there. Just keep going, he ordered himself. But then he stopped. He stopped in horror when the purple curtain around Pirate's Cove began ripping in half, torn from the inside from uh, Foxy's pirate hook. Hudson gaped at what uh, he was seeing. Was this happening, or had this exhibit's animation been completed without his knowledge? As Hudson began shuffling away from Pirate's Cove, the curtain was wrenched apart, and the deformed rabbit animatronic peered out at Hudson. It raised its arm, and Hudson could see the rabbit held a foxy arm. It was the rabbit that had been slashing the curtain. Hudson ran. Several feet down the hall, he checked over his shoulder. He wasn't being chased, but he didn't slow down. He had to get to the towels to stop his bleeding. At least there was one good thing about the animatronic being behind him. It wouldn't be hanging in the inner hall, which Hudson realised he'd have to pass through to get to the lobby. Squaring his shoulders, he forged ahead, turning down the hall where the animatronic was hanging at the start of the... The animatronic was hanging on the wall, just where Barry and Duane left it. How did it get back here? Watching the horrible robotic character, Hudson shuffled past as fast as he could. The animatronic didn't move. Hudson checked it several times after he passed it, but it kept hanging there, silent, still. Finally, he concentrated on getting to his destination. He was almost there, but every step he took, he felt weaker. He couldn't walk in a straight line, and his sight was getting a little blurry. Determined, he worked his way down the long hall and made the turn toward the lobby. It took longer to get there than it should have, but he got there. Unfortunately, the shop was mostly dark. Lights from the lobby barely reached the space. They provided only enough illumination to create amorphous shapes. Stumbling into the darkened space, Hudson used his right hand to feel along the shelves. He groped for the textiles he knew were here. Feeling fur, he made his way past the plushies and action figures. Hey, did something nip at him? No, he was just imagining things, which was understandable given what he'd experienced this evening. He kept going and he finally found the towels. He grabbed a stack of them and started wrapping them around his arm. When they wouldn't stay, he felt around when he found the Chica headbands uh, he remembered were here. Uh, he... Oh, right, yeah. Sorry, I was very confused with that sentence. He used those to tie the towels in place. It was an awkward and painful process. He had to keep moving his arm to position the towels and the bands, and every time he did, his wrist protected him in blazing, um, in blazing blasts of pain. He gritted his teeth, hissed out his breath, and kept working on wrapping his arm. Finally, he finished. Now for the front door. Still weak, but encouraged by the process he'd made, uh, Hudson thought about what was in the gift shop. What could he use to break the glass door? Sporting goods. Hadn't he seen a baseball bat in here? Hudson took a step forward, where he thought he'd find a bat but a loud fluttering sound stopped him. He squinted into the darkness. He saw movement. What was that? He couldn't tell, but he could tell the movement was advancing his way. He backed out of the gift shop. He was nearly out of the gift shop when he smelled something that made him throw up all over the floor. He couldn't help it. It was a reflex. He smelled black cherry pipe tobacco. And now he smelled the acidic stench of vomit. You gonna mess your room, boy? <laughs> Lewis bellowed. You can just stay there and breathe it in. Hudson wa wavered on his feet, staring in amuse uh, um, sorry, not amusement, amazement, while Lewis stormed around his room and gathered every toy Hudson had ever owned. Piling them, lining them up, Lewis created a barrier at the doorway of Hudson's room. Live in the sink, little boy, Lewis growled. Trying not to breathe through his nose, Hudson turned to his bed. But his bed wasn't there. He wasn't in his room. He was outside the gift shop. Breathing through his nose, he took a step into the lobby. He had to get to the front doors, but what happened next wasn't the way he'd planned to do it. Hudson was suddenly lifted off the floor and up into the air. Then he was thrown across the lobby. Somehow, as he flew into the air, Hudson was flipped over. He hit the wall on the opposite side of the lobby with his back and a disturbing crunch and more pain than his mind was able to fathom. He slid to the floor, landing on his left side, on his slashed arm and broken wrist. The initial impact felt just like it had when Lewis had thrown him onto a wall, but the aftermath was worse. When did Lewis do that? Was it before or after the barrier of toys? Hudson couldn't remember. Where was he now? Was he in his past? 
Or was he in the present? He didn't know. All he knew was pain. Hudson bellowed at the top of his lungs. Then he panted like a dog. Was this the same injury, a new one? If it was new, had the fused discs held? Hudson couldn't tell. His back was a radiating pulsation of pain. He lay still, afraid to ask anything else of his battered body. As he lay on his side, breathing shallowly, um, he tried to check his surroundings. Was Lewis still in his room? Was the rabbit animatronic going to show up again? He craned his neck to look all over the lobby. He saw nothing out of place. No, wait, something was out of place. On the wall above him, a large vent cover was hanging by one screw. The cover was swinging slowly. The dark passage it had concealed, now wide open to anyone or anything. Could the animatronic have thrown him and then retreated into the vent? The sickly scent of cherry pipe tobacco hung in the air again. He had to get away from the horror in this building. Gingerly moving his legs, which made his back kink up in a stiff protest, Hudson tried to get in a position so he could stand. No matter how much it hurt, he couldn't just lie here and let the animatronic or whatever was tormenting him make its next move. He needed to get to the doors. Hudson turned to look toward them. He gasped. No way. No freaking way. He blinked, rubbed his eyes with his right hand and looked again. Yes, he was seeing what he was seeing. The doors were being guarded by the gift shop's entire supply of plushies and action figures. They were lined up and poised for action, and they were all watching him. Hudson stood and screamed. Oh god, this is creepy. His back felt like it was being torn in half. His wrist felt like it was filled with ground glass. His arm was pounding uh, out a staccato beat of intense, tortuous pain. He couldn't take much more. He had to hide. But where? He looked up and down the hall, stretching away from the lobby, and his gaze landed on the kitchen doorway at the far end of the left hall. Holding his breath, he took a step in that direction. He knew where he could go. Heat purges. He could hear Granny's voice in his head. Fire heals. The fireplace. He'd be safe in the fireplace. Lewis couldn't reach him there. Heat purges. Fire heals. Using these two phrases as a mantra, Hudson began shuffling toward the kitchen. Each step was a new ev elevation of the pain. Each of his footfalls made him wonder if he'd make it. When he asked himself if he'd make it, he told himself, heat purges, fire heals. Oh, wait. He's going to set the place on fire. He's going to set the place on fire. Because it's Fazbear's Fright. It, it, this, is, this is definitely where this, is, this story is going. He's going to set the place on fire and, and die. Uh, he didn't mean the words literally. He had no intention of heating anything or setting fire to anything. Oh, wait. <laughs> oh, but the words had reminded him of where he could hide. The words seemed to control his feet, so they, uh, so they kept moving towards Hudson's destination. When he reached it, he stood in front of it and smiled. He wondered why he hadn't thought of this before. Hudson reached out with his right hand and tugged on one of the industrial oven doors. As soon as it opened, he gingerly climbed inside the oven. There he sat, stretched out his legs, and grabbed the door. He pulled it closed with a satisfying whoomp. Finally, he was safe. Or was he? As he huddled against the hard, cold walls uh, of the oven, Hudson's mind went black, uh, back sorry, once again to the past. Safe was what he thought he was the night he wrestled the knife from Lewis and threatened the man with it. Leave me alone, he'd screamed. Never touch me again. Well, tell everyone everything. Lewis had laughed at him. Kid, you're not going to tell anyone anything. They'll think they know what they need to know. And with that strange state statement, Lewis had disappeared into the kitchen and Hudson had crawled into the fireplace to hide. The next thing Hudson knew, there was a fire in the fireplace and then the house was on fire. Hudson barely got out alive. The burns on his legs left him with the nerve damage that had barred him away from the Navy. He didn't set the fire, did he? He told everyone he didn't set it because he believed he didn't. A popping sound yanked Hudson from his re rev... Rever referee. <laughs> I don't know what that is. What was that? He listened. Wait, so you know how how he, um Faith uh he he was Faith was like, did you do it? So I'm assuming the thing that he in like inverted commas that he did was set the fire in the house. Huh. Okay. I see where this is going. And he heard a rustling sound and a snap. 
Hudson hunched over in the fireplace and he listened for Lewis as he looked at Lewis's lighter. When had Hudson taken it? He didn't remember, but it was his now. Hudson could feel Lewis's lighter in his hand. He could feel his thumb on the little starter wheel. Flames started crawling up the curtains next to the fireplace. In the oven, something whirred, then made a little spitting sound. Hudson heard a concussive burst like a backdraft, blowing open a door. He looked down at his empty hands. The cool walls of the oven started warming up. Hudson shot away from the oven walls. No! Panicked, Hudson kicked at the oven door. It didn't budge. Open the door, he shouted. He kicked again. The door remained closed. Oh, Hudson, a voice said. It was Granny Foster. Huh? Okay. Hudson looked around the oven and tried to see out through the thick glass opening in the door. He couldn't see anyone. Granny, get me out of here, Hudson yelled. Oh, Hudson, Granny's voice repeated. Her voice wasn't coming from outside the oven. It was inside with Hudson. The oven got hotter. Hudson started to sweat. Help me! Hudson heard what sounded like a sigh rushing through the oven. Your path is your path, Granny's voice said, and the oven got hotter and hotter. I am so confused. <laughs> I'm, there's three pages left. Where can this go? I'm so confused. Okay. Okay. You know what I'm going to miss most when we start training? Dwayne asked Barry as the two men climbed the steps to the front of Fazbear's Frights. What? Barry pulled out his keys and unlocked the front doors. He was a little surprised he had to do that. Usually Hudson was down here already unlocking the doors. Your grandma's cooking, Duane said. Barry laughed, then sobered. I would have said that too, until I met Faith. That'll work out, Duane said as they stepped into the building. Where's Hudson? Barry asked. Hudson? Duane called. What's that smell? Barry wrinkled up his face. Duane covered his nose. Smells like something burning. Hey, did you hear about the fire at the circus? What? It was intense. Oh, I... <laughs> oh, come on. Come on. I, I thought he was going to talk about the Circus Baby Pizza one. <laughs> uh, it was intense. Duane laughed loudly. Get it? In, in Intense? Barry shook his head. Hudson, he called. They waited, breathing shallowly. No one answered. Let's go check the office, Barry said. The men headed down the main hall. They looked around as they went. Everything was the same as it had been when they left the night before. Same stacks of boxes, same animatronic they'd hooked to the wall. Dwayne bent over. I forgot to pick up this tooth last night. We can glue it back in. They went down the hall and leaned into the open door of the office. It looked normal too, but Hudson wasn't in it. Where the heck is he? Dwayne asked. Barry shook his head. Dwayne laughed. Maybe he finally got smart and left this crummy town. That wouldn't be a bad thing, Barry said. I'd miss him, but he could use a fresh start. Dwayne made a face. The smell is stronger down here. It's coming from the kitchen, I think, Barry said. Let's go check it out. As the two headed toward the kitchen, Barry said, I feel for Hudson. Poor guy deserves to have something go right. Ha. Huh. Okay. Okay. I'm confused! <laughs> I'm very confused. Oh, uh, what? What? I'm so confused. Oh my god. You know, everybody used to say like, oh, the FNAF lore is, is confusing. That was before the Fazbear Frights books came out. And I was like, okay, yeah, it's, it's pretty confusing, but at least it's kind of, like, consistent, you know? Kind of consistent. I mean, there is a few inconsistencies, but hey-ho. Then all of these stories started came, coming out, and now I'm completely lost with everything. <laughs> like, everything I thought I knew about the FNAF universe just doesn't work anymore. Um, what is this? I don't get it. I, I don't... So, I, I'm assuming he did... He was... He was actually in the oven at Fazbear Frights and he burnt up and he heard his grand's voice. I don't get that part. I don't get the parts where like Lewis's voice he could hear and his, his grand's voice he could hear. I don't get all of that. I don't understand. Is it like hallucinations? Is it like, like in FNAF 3 with like the phantom animatronics and like hallucinating and stuff? Is it something like that? 
I really don't know. I'm really confused. The the animatronic was clearly Springtrap. I mean, we can all agree with that, right? Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I honestly have no idea how all of these different things tie together. Um, but also, also, I heard um, rumours that this story was supposed to be evidence for uh, Mike Victim. Wait, no, was it Mike Trap? No, it was Mike Victim, I think. Either way, I don't really get why. <laughs> uh, you guys are going to have to maybe explain in the comments, but I hope you enjoyed the audiobook. Um, this was this was a blast. Um, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just baffled at how confused I am. Oh, God. Okay, well, thank you guys for watching. Uh, if you do enjoy these audiobooks, then make sure you subscribe so that you see more when they come out. Next time, we are going to be doing... The, uh, well, not about the authors, uh, we're going to be doing the next, uh, Stitch Wraith thingy, and it's only 39 pages long, so it'll probably be, yeah. Yeah, I, I, actually, this, I'm really excited for this Stitch Wraith, because, um, I really, I really want to see where this goes. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one. Goodbye!